like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, I'm excited today. We've got people here. We're going to talk about Ops Firewood. Now let me say from the start, we're talking about Ops Firewood from the viewpoint of two Ricky and not of the other units. I know there were a lot of other units there that day. The paratroopers, 101 battalion, 5 Ricky. I believe the battle group was under the command of a paratrooper officer, James Hill. And they were into Angola to attack the base. And that's what we're talking about. But as I say, we're talking about two Ricky and not from the rest of the units. And I want to make an invitation. If it's the other units, if you're listening to us here, please contact me. Let us make a proper uh, Ops Firewood uh, episode in the future where everybody is and we can make it two, three episodes so that we can tell the generations after us what happened that day. Now let me introduce my guest. I will ask them to introduce themselves. I think we'll start with uh, Daryl. If you can tell us and then we'll go over to Greg and then we'll start talking about what these men actually experienced that day. It's a fantastic story. I must tell you, I've been excited for weeks now to do this episode. Daryl, Greg, welcome here, mate. We're still waiting for another mate from as well. Sean, he might join us, might not. But you're all welcome here. I thank you for your time. Daryl, tell me, where do you come from? Um, of course, I, I grew up in Sanin. Um, went to Marinsky High School. Um, finished in 79 and um, I took a, a year break. I can't remember what happened, but I, I went to, to the army um, in 81, I believe, yeah, 81. I went to the Air Force um, and um, we had a bit of a disagreement there with somebody on the parade ground and they didn't like me there. So um, they sent me off to signal school in Heidelberg, which um, where I did second phase. And then from there, I, um, I landed up at Special Forces HQ. Um, I was there for a very short time and I said I, need, I wanted to get to the border. And um, I went uh, to Dopis. They sent me to Fort Dopis, where I met Greg and uh, Doc Maritz. Um, there for, uh, and I was there for about six months or so, and then off to um, to Fort Reef at Ondangwa, and I spent the rest of my my time there until the the end of, of national service, and then um, I I was uh, dealt into two Reiki as um, as one of the signalers with with two Reiki, and that's basically my story. Okay, I'll leave it there because you were pastor today. You tell me I'm not going to talk about the incident, which I uh, understand was a bit of violence. You know, we all did things in our young days. But you're welcome here, Daryl. Thanks for calling me. Greg, it's over to you. You're a Special Forces member. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I grew up, I was a farm boy. Although born in Johannesburg at the age of four, my parents moved down uh, to a farm close to the Kruger National Park. So, from an early age, I learned uh, to live in the bush, um, used to run around with the dogs, and I learned to live in the bush and from the land as well. So it helped me many years later in areas like bushcraft, tracking, and survival. I went to a little farm school. I was the only English-speaking guy there. I was number 101 of 101. This Beich of Bars, that they would say in Afrikaans, you know, bite the bullet. So I learned Afrikaans. Some Afrikaans was a lot better than my English was. Um, I went to school in Nelspreit at a newly established English high school called Lofeld High uh, and spoke English with a very heavy guttural Afrikaans accent, which I lost years later when I went for elocution lessons at university. Um, I got my call up to go to Forsai. I dreaded Forsyth. It was just one of those bases you just don't like. And I thought, I'll do anything to get out of here. I'll even become a chef. And the first thing we knew, <laughs> the first thing we knew that the guys from Parachute Battalion came around and we did the basic sort of selection criteria for that. Um, and I was really fit at that stage. I'd been training hard and 
they said after 150 sit-ups, you can stop now. That's fine. So I um, ended up going to parachute battalion. Where I did my basics and then got ready for the PT course. And we were in the second week of our PT course on the Wednesday when a bunch of guys from one reconnaissance regiment or commando as it was in those days came around and they showed us the recruitment video. And if we were interested, we should do their tests, which we did. There were a few of us that were interested, uh, passed those tests, but they said to us, we'd only be collected um, and we'd put, be put on the train about a week later. Of course, parachute battalion are very precious about the guys who stay there and they would not let us finish the PT course. So we had to sit that uh, the rest of the week out. I did my pre-selection um, at Three Sai, which was in Potterstrom, where all the uh, instructors and officers from Wanariki that would be part of the selection course were there. Um, and we went through then the second part of our training was conventional and unconventional warfare. And then I discovered that I'd been turned down medically because my eyes were quite bad. I used to wear glasses in those days. I wear contacts today. And, but they didn't tell me why. I was adamant and I wanted to get back into the regiment. Um, all the guys that I'd been with who'd been selected had then gone off for their selection course. That was around about June or July in 1977. I tried to get there by hook or by crook. And eventually I managed to get to... Pretoria saying that I wanted to go to the equestrian center permanent force. And that's fine. And the day that I came to say, how's it, Bob? I'm here for the job. They said to me, uh, is this your final thing? I said, no, I want to go to Wanreki, even as a support unit member, as a chef, anything, just get me there because the opportunity would present itself. So cut the long story short, I ended up at Wanreki and the acting commanding officer at that stage was John Moore. I told him my story and he said, if you're so serious about it, just stay and we'll put you onto the courses but promise me that you'll score a minimum of 85 on all the courses now these courses were the courses that the cycle group i'd been with who passed the selection were doing and um so i stayed with them from june uh july through until i would say early october beginning of november when the next selection course were getting ready and there were 861 of them who had applied of which um, 48 of us finished the PT course. We had to do it in November in Durban in Smocks. And if anybody knows what Durban is like that time of the year, um, I think Thailand can learn a lesson or two. It's pretty hot and humid. And uh, yeah, so I was one of the guys who finished. I ended up going back to Parachute Battalion and you get the dirty looks from the guys that you'd been with before. Did our jumping course and we thought, well, this is it. We expected to go to uh, Northern Zuland where all the other courses are gone. But when we were on the plane, I had a look and we weren't flying sort of northeast. We were flying due north. And uh, we did our selection in the Caprivi. I was one of 10 guys who eventually finished. And I stayed on at one recce then for a period of seven years. Uh, with a year's break in between, I went to university, which turned out to be part of my downfall because I went to Wits. Um, for the international guys, the University of the Witwatersrand, which was the breeding ground of the UDF, which was the forerunner of the ANC and a lot of people. So I was uh, deemed to be communist, uh, even when I went back. So I was not uh, sort of held in high regard by the officers there because they thought I was um, a mole or something like that. I finished off at one recce. I tried to go the officer's course way, but I'd been blocked. Um, and I'm not going to go into that uh, for whatever reason. And as soon as I left, I ended up at Tureki. And at Tureki, uh, we were quite active from that period of 1983, 84 onwards to the time of this operation, which was firewood. But I stayed on with uh, Tureki the same duration as Daryl and a lot of the other guys did until 1991. I left there um, after that. Um, and that's my military history. Well, I'm glad to tell all of you that we are going to have a full interview with both of them in the future. And then we'll, we'll get to the, to the nitty gritty. But two Reiki is like the reserve wing of, of a reconnaissance uh, regiment's commandos, um, not the active force. Um, am I correct? Can you just tell us a bit about two Reiki, please? I would say, yes, they are the reserve, but they were also for guys who had to do national service. And we ended up with a lot of guys 
that came in. Even Justin Taylor, who you interviewed a while back from 32 Battalion, didn't have a place to go to, and he was there. Um, and then there were a lot of us who were volunteers um, who had the commitment, wanted to do it, and I was lucky. I worked for a company that uh, supported the the efforts of the of the government of the day and said whatever you need to do so if you have to go away for three months or two weeks or whatever let us know and we'll do that and it was very difficult uh, juggling a job in between doing that but we were active um, and they kept on drawing on us because remember we had guys at that stage who were from the old one reconnaissance commando which then became one reconnaissance regiment uh, four ricky which is a seaborne five ricky um, and then sort of guys in between um, and I say guys in between various other people. So it was a good uh, pool of resources that was lying there that people could actually draw on. And um, so on a regular basis, we were drawn on. So on the operation, for instance, before um, we participated in firewood in the preceding years, we had Coliseum and a few others. Uh, Turek had been actively involved. And primarily you worked with the regiment that you were closest to. So if it was one, then you worked with one. And often we, from one, we had been previously uh, worked with five Ricky. My Seaborn experience was minimal, so I didn't work with uh, four Ricky. But generally, that's who you would um, assign to for the duration of the period or the contract, uh, the, the job that you were doing. Okay, great. So there's no reason to say that two Ricky is somehow a lesser unit or something like some people think. This is the same standard, the same special forces. It's just that a bit different. I would say so, yes. And I think Daryl will concur with me in many respects. Sometimes you'd find you'd been out of, say, out of action for a while, uh, which they realized. So we often had um, training or, when I say call-ups, on weekends to go and do things, or they'd send guys on courses uh, for your call-up. Or if you went up to the bush, they would give you a bit of uh, acclimatization time and time to reshop and rehone your skills again. So, and I'm sure Daryl can uh, attest to that as well. Yeah, I think with, with firewood as well, um, it was a three month camp if I'm correct, correct. Um, and, and we did retraining for, a, for just about a whole month before we, before we started on the, on the operation. So, and we did a lot of courses and stuff back home um, uh, lots of weekends and also short short camps like a week at a time or two weeks at a time uh, just for, for training purposes and to keep the guys sharp. So yeah, it was quite active in, in two. Um, I also worked for staff here at that stage and, and they were also very happy to, to release me um, to, to, to go and do camps and stuff like that. So I, um, I volunteered a lot and um, so I was, I was used and uh, it was good, yeah. I've been recording uh, General McKeel Alexander here for many, many hours now. Fantastic man, paratrooper general. But he started off as a citizen force soldier and then only joined the army at about the PF when he was about 28, 29 years old. Now I have a question for both of you. Do you think your civilian experience will make you more rounded, perhaps different views, than the guy who just stayed, say, in one rec reconnaissance and didn't have any civilian experience whatsoever? I would say yes. Um, and I'm going to qualify this by saying, let me look at my military stint when I was at one recce, went out for a year and then came back. All of a sudden, you get exposed to things which you, in your closed and protected environment, because it is, you're protected from the outside world and you're very much military focused. You tend to be exposed to a lot more. Um, you see a lot of things that you don't necessarily agree with. And then you always think, am I thinking, am I the only one thinking this way or are there people that are thinking differently? And it exposes you to that and makes you think. And in many respects, I found that when I went back, I was challenging the norm. And a lot of people didn't like that. That was one. And I found that when we were too Ricky, the, the stuff that you were exposed to and the stuff that you learned made you better rounded and more grounded, uh, excuse me, more grounded person. Um, and, and I'm grateful for that. I, I'm not knocking anybody who was a career soldier and stayed in all the time. But I think you would find that after a period of time, you do get tunnel vision um, and you do end up just 
seeing that and you get minimum exposure. Also remember in those days, we did not have access to the thing called the internet. Um, our information that we got was either from the newspapers or from TV or radio. And it was very restricted and uh, fairly controlled in those days. So I would say yes. Uh, Daryl? Yeah, yes, I, I agree, Greg. I am. Um... Um, I wasn't in for, for a long time, but I, I definitely think it, it helped to, to just get, get both sides of the coin instead of just being in the military. I, I think, um, and, and not anybody specific, but a lot of people after the war really battled to reintegrate into civilian life. And it, it, it was hard for a lot of people. I've, I've spoken to a few guys and it, it wasn't easy. So, um, yeah, I think we were blessed to be able to, to be with Tureki and um, it, it did make things easier. Like I say, I wasn't there for a long time. Um, not in, I mean, in, in the military for a long time permanently. Um, I was in Tureki from 1983 until 1992, it was, Greg, when it closed, not so. So, yes, um, I, I really think it did make a difference, yeah. Well, now I have to go over to the actual operation. Now you called up, I think in 1987. Do you have any idea why you've been called up or just the uh, uh, papers just arrive and you, you know, you go off and you'll find out? Is, is it like that? Chris, you're in, the, you're in the dark ages. Papers didn't arrive. You got a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> we we worked on a on a quick response mechanism and whereby we worked like cells and somebody would phone you and you'd phone somebody else and that's the way it worked. Um, we were told it was an operation that was coming up, and I think if we were aware of what was going on, pre, uh, like with the Operation Coliseum the year before, where we had lost Andre Rankin um, from Tureki, uh, we were aware that there was ongoing stuff. And let's make no mistake at that stage we knew that there was a lot that was going on uh, often the absence of of what was in the newspapers but there was a fair amount in the newspapers and then the guys talk and you know if you um actively involved which i was at two ricky um the guys were saying there's something coming there's something coming so when the call came we knew what it was but didn't know specifically what the action was going to be and we were only really exposed to that, if I recall, once we were um, at Oshavello, where we had been uh, grouped together to do the pre-training, acclimatization, preparation for the operation. Um, and obviously, we tried to call up a number of, uh, and get as many people involved as we could at that stage. Um, and you would have seen from the material that has been sent to you, we had quite a large number of people there. And obviously, this was to supplement and to complement the other battle force. Thank you, Daryl. You also got the phone call. Yeah, I, I did. I, I got a phone call from, um, there was a lady that used to work there in the admin department. Um, and like I said, I was with Safi and they were very, very lenient. And um, yeah, so I, I didn't know what it was about, obviously. Um, it was actually, there was a big group called up, but not everybody went on the op. A lot of people only stayed for a month and then came home um, and other guys stayed on. And eventually, I think from two recce, I think 19 guys stayed behind. Craig, if I remember correctly. That's, that's correct, yes. Okay, so then you flew up north. And you end up at Oshivelo. Yeah, we, yep. we flew from Waterkloof. Sorry, Gregors. No, carry um, on. We flew from Waterkloof. Um, and um, obviously, I was, um, uh, we flew up with a SAFE aircraft. I don't know if you can remember. And um, I, I take, took uh, uh, Colonel Sabi into the cockpit because I knew all the guys and, and so on. Um, yeah, we landed at. Um, was it Grootfontein, Greg? No, we went to Ondangwa. Ondangwa. And then we drove down to Oshivelo, yeah, to, to start the retraining. But we stayed in tents in, in Oshivelo. It was a, a dusty, tented area that we stayed in. For, now for those who don't know, 
Um, Oshivelo is about 130 kilometers south of Ondongwa and Kritfontein, those two being close together. And we were sort of just outside the operational area near the, um, near the national park. Um, and that's where we were based. So it was fairly dry. Yeah. Newswap, I think. Close to Newswap, right? Eh? Yeah. So what happened once you arrived there? Because I understand the, what you encountered later were not quite the same as what you were training at uh, Oshivella. You, you're quite right, Chris. Um, we got there and um, as Daryl had said, our, our accommodation left much to be desired. We had normal army tents that we stayed in um, and we weren't told very much. We were kept very much in the dark, but we told what we had to do in terms of our training. So we got fit and we trained the whole day. We ran all over the place. And, you know, here you've got a bunch of guys of different, different levels of fitness. You've got guys from different regiments as well. Uh, so either one, four or five, and some we knew and some we didn't. Um, so it was a period of time to also bond and, and learn to work with one another. So that was the first part of it, which was important. The second part is that where we were based, um, there was a Cape Color Corps regiment that was there. They were mostly infantry. Um, and as part of our training, they were tasked to uh, be the marauders or to hunt us down and to chase us. So our training meant that we had to be out in the bush. We slept out in the bush. Now we're coming out of winter, so it was still a bit cold and it's starting to get warmer for um, uh, spring. And um, so at night we'd be out sleeping um, in our little temporary bases. And then uh, the guys would, the, from the from the Cape Color Corps Regiment would be mortaring us and chasing us. And this was part of our training and, and preparation. We also had some trenches that had been dug based on the information provided by intelligence as to what to expect. And we did trench clearing and we did attacks on the, on the simulated base. Um, and that was ongoing. And as Daryl had alluded to early on, it was extremely dusty. It's this fine red dust, which just gets into everything. But, you know, we, we weren't aware at that stage that in terms of the preparation and the intelligence that had been gained, where we were training was based on the aerial photography. So it was very really dry and uh, semi-desert in a way. But the rainy season had started fairly up north, uh, earlier up north. And where we were going to go into, when we got there, it was chalk and cheese. Uh, the bush was very, very thick. And what we had trained for and what we pre had prepared for wasn't the same, but you know, it's raincoats on and raincoats off. I have a question. If you say the Cape Color Corps uh, mortared you, what do you mean by that? They were tasked on to try and either scare us, chase us or whatever. I don't know what the exact briefing was, but what they were tasked to do was to uh, drop mortars in the designated area, which they anticipated we would be in. And, you know, it was very much like my uh, early training when we were doing our cycle where our instructors would mortar us at night. And, you know, when those mortars start raining down on you and they uh, 100 meters away and they're starting to get closer and closer, you know, you, you sleep with your boots on. So you grab your stuff, pick it up and you go to your rendezvous point, which is a predetermined thing. And that's just part of your training. So it kept us on our toes. Thank you for that. Taro, what happened to you there at uh, the training grounds, if I may call it like that? Yeah, very much, very much the, the same as with Greg, all the, all the retraining and, and, and stuff that went on. Um, I was the designated signaler, so we also got some new equipment and stuff that we just had to be retrained on, and then obviously also into the bush, um, sleep in the bush, and and uh, do the mock attacks and all these things. So basically, very, it was the same as, as what Greg endured. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. I, I enjoyed it. I was reasonably fit. I was still young, so <laughs> it was, it was quite good. Um, yeah. So basically, very much the, the same as Greg. Yes. I would like to just add something there, if I may. Um, because we've been kept in the dark um, and not really been told what was been happening, we had a bunch of grumbling, unhappy people 
um, that were not being informed. We knew it was going to happen, but we didn't know when. Now, here you've got a bunch of frustrated people who just want to get out and fight. We, we knew we knew broadly what we we're going to be doing, but we didn't know when and, and how. We got a guy, another Sean in our group called Sean Froud, a uh, very colorful guy. Uh, he was staying in KwaZulu Natal at that stage. He now stays in New Zealand. And um, Sean, you always used to walk around without a shirt, baggy pants, his shoes, and he had uh, a toggle around his old scout, um, what you called flag or whatever he used to, what are those things that the scouts wear around their neck? Anyway, he used to wear that. And he always used to complain about this and that. And I remember we had a visit from then, I think it was General Jake Swartz uh, or Brigadier who came around and he was acting as liaison officer and just making sure that things were going fine. And Sean being outspoken as he was, um, they tried to keep him busy like a dog with a bone. You know, Colonel Sabi from the Spade then said, you know, just keep Sean away, keep Sean away and so on. And the guys who were like the, the stirrers. And uh, so uh, the day that uh, uh, Jake Swart arrived, we were there and sort of unexpectedly he called everybody together. They said, okay, mana, prat mit me. Talk to me, guys. What's going on here? And of course, Sean put his hand up at the back there. Now, we were struggling without equipment. We didn't have what we're supposed to have had. Our preparation time, we were going to be using Biffles, which is the, in, the standard infantry uh, armored carrier with a V base, um, until we actually got the Caspers, which were the far heavier and more robust vehicles that the op would be uh, equipped with at a later stage. But in the meantime, we had the Biffles. And now Sean put his hand up there um, and he said, um, whether it was Brigadier or General at that stage, he said, excuse me, sir. He said, why do we always have to suck the hind tit? Um, and that became the legacy of part of the operation in many respects, because that's what was happening. Um, our, our use and how we were applied in the operation was wrong. Uh, a lot of people talk about it and so on and say we were just utilized as as infantry troops on the ground um, and our training was a lot better than that and we should be used more strategically uh, and tactically but it didn't happen but i always remember this and there was even a drawing that sean had done about this thing so anyway i just wanted to raise it that was of important you know uh, it was of importance um, needless to say we never did get the caspers that we were promised uh, we ended up having to stay with the loan vehicles we got from the cape color corps which ended up being detrimental to our operational capabilities when we arrived um, at the uh, base which we were going to attack. Yeah, how was Colonel Sabi von Espey as a man, as an officer? Daryl, um, I think you should answer that. I think, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I had a lot of respect for him, um, straight shooter. No, no issues. Um, you, you know exactly what you got from him. And um, yeah, I, I, I think um, I really enjoyed Colonel Sabi. He was really a pleasant guy to me. Um, um, I know he, he had certain things that he wanted done in a certain way and don't deviate from that. Um, so he was really, he was really strict and and he know and knew what what he wanted. And with with Sean that day, he nearly had a small heart attack when when he said what he did. Um, so he was not he was not happy with stuff like that. And um, on the way up, somebody got a um, a blow of beer's um, head and put it on one of the buffels. Can't I don't know if you can remember. And Colonel Sabi saw it at some stage somewhere along the line. And he also had a heart attack. We must take this thing off. And so, you know, he was very straight and he knew exactly what he wanted. Very pleasant, though. I, I really enjoyed him. I never had an issue with him. You know, one of the things that, that Colonel Sabi had at that stage, he had the respect of the men because where he had come from, um, he was a... He was a, a mechanical engineer, if I remember correctly, um, running a company, but he'd, he'd been the force behind the start of uh, Two Ricky. In fact, the preceding uh, regiment before that, which was called the Hunter Group, he'd initiated and been part of the team who initiated it uh, with a lot of the guys like uh, General Gil von Kerkwerven and a few of the others many years before. 
um, and he'd worked his way up. He'd done his selection course. He'd done the diving course. Um, he did minor tactics with me. Um, and he was a man of small stature. He was quite small, but he was as tough, as tough as could be. Um, and, and he had that respect of men and, and so on. And the role that he had to play during the lead up and even into the operation was difficult because um, they wanted our skills and to use Tureki as a resource, but we weren't be given those skills. And yet he had to placate everybody else along the way. And as a result of that, he, I think he was trying to manage expectations on all sides and still deliver uh, a great service, which was going to be our service that we deliver. Now, if there's one thing which all the Rikis, which I've heard you on before, tells me is the proper briefings. They would say to me, because we would go into detail like you cannot believe. Every man knew what to do with three or four backup plans. Fantastic planning behind it. This operation, did it deviate from this at all or were you properly briefed? I want to ask Daryl what uh, his perspective is on this, please, and then I will answer. Yeah, I, I, I definitely don't think we were properly briefed. Um, there was either stuff not not told to us, or there was stuff that wasn't known. Or, um, but I really went into this thing. I mean, the the evening before we left for for Rundu. Um, Major Jan van der Merwe came to me and he said, you the gunner on the buffalo, go and get yourself a rifle or get, get yourself a machine gun. It, I mean, it was like six o'clock in the evening, um, you know, so that I couldn't even go and get the gun. I had to do it the next morning before we left. I had to run and, and, and pick up a gun. So from my perspective, I, I don't think we were properly briefed on, on this thing. I remember we got together in the tent with... Um, um, Brigadier Swar that one morning and the guy spoke and we we were briefed obviously um, I believe we we could have been briefed better but that's my my perception Greg I I concur uh, with Daryl for the simple reason that we were told but we weren't given the nitty gritty as we normally would do like when you do that that say as you read Hearst and what we've gone gone through and, and what was going to happen. We had no idea that there were going to be other, uh, but we knew the battalions or other regiments involved. We didn't know whom. We knew Five Ricky was going to be there, but we had, didn't have any clue about 101 Battalion or the uh, Parachute Battalion. Um, and we knew it was a base attack. There'd been a sand model. We'd been rehearsing, but not the exact details. It happened actually whilst... Um, we were close to the target and the day before where they went through that again with us. And there were a lot of people involved. There were even people from the air force that were entrenched with us as well. So there were quite a few other people involved. And I think the number of vehicles, if I, I stand correct, was about hundred and close to 150, 160 vehicles. Uh, Cause remember for a, uh, and a group like this, you need food, you need petrol, you need water, you need medical supplies, you need ammunition. It was massive, and we didn't know this until we all of a sudden fell into uh, the queue of vehicles going through the sand and just dust, clouds and clouds of dust. And here we were with our little buffels who have got that have got small Unimog engines, and everybody else had the bigger vehicles that were far more capable and just churned their way through the sand. We struggled, we struggled. Also, our vehicle that we were on only had one, only had four gears, had no reverse gear. And the guy said, nah, it's fine. You're going to get other vehicles. We didn't. And that was part of our downfall. Um, the briefing on the day before was, was, I remember the opening line. It said, guys, it's going to be like shopping at pick and pay. You're going to go in early in the morning. The Air Force is going to come in. They're going to bomb it. And so on. You go and you mop up and you'll be home that afternoon in time to watch the rugby. That's how it was positioned to us. It was quite easy. And I think there was overconfidence. Now, take into account at that stage, this was all leading up to uh, far bigger battles that were about to take place. So the defense force, as it was then, was not sleeping. But I think this was one of the operations that needed to be taken care of. 
I know that there were one recce operators that were in the bush at that stage um, because some of them have been involved in a number of skirmishes and I bumped into them at the at one mill hospital uh, in Pretoria um, after our operation and they'd come out of that. Um, there were five recce guys who were involved in doing a number of things and obviously the small team small team operators also had to pinpoint exactly where the bases were. Um, and if you read that information in the various books which are around, you will see a lot of that. And, you know, we were told we're going to go in. This is what's going to happen. Um, and Bob's your uncle. So they formed a battle group. And please correct me if I'm wrong. They formed a battle group of a lot of vehicles, mostly Caspers, your um, Biffles. Uh, there were some 6-1 Meg Rattles as well. And now we're moving into Angola. We're going to attack West Base. So you form a column, I suppose, and off you go into, into danger. Yes, we did. Um, and, you know, you're not following any of the roads because they wanted to uh, surprise the enemy. Daryl, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was three, four days of travel before from Rundu that we traveled through the bush to get there. Yeah, it, it was probably four days. And then we got to Ayunda or Ayundi or something like that. And we stayed there uh, one or two nights and then left from there to the target. But yeah, it was at least uh, probably four days or so from Rundu. Uh, yeah. For the uninitiated, Rundu is right on the border, on, um, on the Southwest African or now Namibian border with Angola. And there was a big military base here. And that's where we were able to cross um, into Angola without having to navigate rivers and things like that as well. And then it was going more or less directly north. Um, it, it, it was difficult for us um, in our vehicles, and you suck dust. That's all you do. So I remember wearing goggles. I, I, I wear contact lenses, and um, it, I felt like somebody had poured some sandpaper into my eyes and so on. And, I kept, and we looked like cheaters after. We had this dust um, and mud streaks running down us like it. But, you know, that was part and parcel of it. And then we stopped at our uh, various RV points and overnight points we were, and then we went to go and talk to the guys at Five Ricky. And I remember walking up to one of their Caspers, and it's like walking into one of these recliner, come comfortable lounges uh, where you're expecting to see uh, dancers and music and things like that because they had subtle lighting, they had their little gas stoves, they had everything rigged out. You know what we had? We had ground sheets and a sleeping bag, and that was it. You slept under the vehicle or place you could find it. And these guys were kitted out. They had their food and they had everything like that. And then we realized just at what a disadvantage we were. But you know what? You bite the bullet um, and you go with it. And so it was the two or three days we went up there. And I just remember that that column was long. We did not realize how big it was. I think we only realized uh, just as the base attack was starting. Um, and then once everybody had regrouped during the, uh, after the attack or during the attack, because the attack more or less had two phases, the first phase we went in and the second follow-up phase. And then when we were being extracted and so on, then we saw the rest of the vehicles. Um, and, and it was, you know, it, I would have liked it if they had just said to us, guys, this is a massive group. This is how many vehicles are going to be and so on. But I think um, we were a small element and we didn't make such a big, we, we, we weren't big in that. And we was, I wouldn't say we were an afterthought. I often get that feeling that we were an afterthought. And I hear people talk about afterwards that we should never have been utilized or abused in such a way. But that's just, you know, hearsay. And that's what people just say talking amongst themselves. I just want to, to clarify to the, to the listener here, I've been once in my life on a buffalo and I, I got out and walked because the thing sways. You get seasick. But worse than that, every branch, I'll get talk, every branch would eat you on the face you, you, and the sun would get you. It's really not the enclosed vehicle. So otherwise, you're quite exposed in that thing. Am I correct if I say this, especially with you people now? In the dust behind the Caspers and the Rattles was really good off road, powerful vehicles, heavy ones. Look, you know, as Daryl said earlier on, there were 19 of us that took part in the operation. And I think a Casper is designed to take 10 people. There we are, it's 10 people. Uh, plus, we had our kit with us and we had a lot of ammunition. Um, I remember 
that one of the gunners on the vehicle, Daryl, I know it wasn't you. Um, I don't know who it was. Um, when we hit a pothole or something like a, that LMG that was mounted on the front swung around and badly hurt his shoulder and his arm. Do you remember that? I, I remember that, but I, I can't remember who it was, but I remember the incident, yes. But it okay. wasn't me. My, my, okay. Mine was still okay. And to answer Chris's question regarding being inside a buffer, um, because it's got a V shape, uh, so that if you go over a landmine, it would deflect most of the blast. Um, it's on a Unimog chassis, and the chassis is on those coil springs, and it rolls around from left to right. Um, and anything that's inside gets shaken about. Somebody asked me once what it was like. I said, imagine being put into a small into a small pot um, on the stove. Okay, so it's warm. Um, you're a frog. And there are a lot of ball bearings and nuts and bolts and things in there. And the chef is just shaking it around a bit like it because all those things are being moved. That's what it's like. You get shaken the whole time. You can't sit. You've got these very really hard sponge seats that you've got to sit on. Um, they're not comfortable. You don't want to sit down because it's like sitting in the heat at the bottom. There's no airflow. And as Chris quite correctly said, you stand up, you get shaken about, and any branch that's there is going to smack you in the face. So... Hey, you know, welcome, welcome to the real world. It's what they used to call in the old days a roofy ride. You know, for those that are not English speaking, um, yeah, it's a real troopy ride. It's uh, it's an initiation they want to give you, and it's not something you want to be in. The sides of the thing flap down when you have to debus and get out, uh, but once you get in, you put them up, and if you stand up, it's about shoulder height. So that gives you a bit of an indication of the size of the inside. Yeah, it it was really dusty and hard and. And bumpy and we, we we stood basically most of the way you, you couldn't really sit i mean you you try to sit but it, it's so bumpy and uh, so you just stood up um yeah it, it 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 wasn't pleasant i think if we compare it to to the caspers and the guys were sleeping in the back of the caspers we had to stay awake uh, i just want to say uh, that it, it was also the parabats was also in buffles so so that they had the same same uh, issue as us. Um, I can't remember how many buffles they had, but we had we had two buffles. Um, yeah, it wasn't pleasant going up there, but we we did, and we like Greg says, we um, we we had a job to do, and and we were going to do it. Doesn't matter what happened. Okay, great. So you arrived at your overnight place. I suppose now you're getting a bit excited because you know the attack's going to go in the next day. Even if it's a pick and pay shopping attack or whatever, I'm surely you didn't believe it. I have to ask you: Did you really believe it when they said it's going to be that easy? I mean, you were experienced soldiers, by the way. Um, Look, Daryl. No, I, I, I remember PJ Furi coming to me, and he got on the side of the buffalo and he said, "TGIF, they, thank God it's Friday and it's going to be." You know, it's just going to be so easy. We're just going to knock these oaks out. The barrages are coming in, and they're just going to clean them out. And um, you know, it's it's just going to be a, a easy day. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the idea that that we had. Obviously, you expected a bit more. We we, we didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't have the foggiest idea. Um, and um, so, yeah. That's all I knew. TGIF, it's going to be a... And then we got delayed as well, remember, Greg? It was supposed to be on the Friday morning, and then something happened, and we only went in on the Saturday morning, actually. I, I remember that, but in the back of my mind, I remember Op Coliseum, which Andre Rinkin was killed in and uh, had been involved with the fire recce the year before. So I thought, you know, the guys had learned a lesson or two. They, had, they got a bit sharper and so on. But that's what you hope. Uh, reality is maybe something different. Now, also bear in mind that where we were this time of the year, this was close on the 30th of November, it was leading up to the 30th of November when the actual uh, Operation Firewood took place. The Battle of Quito Canavale followed very shortly thereafter because this was a hot bed uh, and a hotly contested bed between um, the MPLA and the Cubans against south africa and unita so um you know hindsight is always the best um what they say the best uh, science because you know exactly what's going on but we were leading up to this at this period and um 
I, I did anticipate that we would get some, um, some resistance, but I thought that with the force that we had with us, uh, it would be formidable. My biggest fear was that we'd actually drive into the trenches because you don't want to drive into a trench with any of those vehicles. I know that some of the 101 Caspers actually went into some of those trenches and struggled a bit during the course of the battle. But that was my biggest fear in driving in. And we did not anticipate the thick bush that we found. Um, I can tell you that the night before, we were tasked uh, by Major Jan van der Merwe to take some documentation through to the command group um, and we were in a, in a lager, in other words, a, a secure uh, temporary base with all the vehicles on the outside and so on, and it was secure on the inside, just in case of any attack or whatever. And we were told to take some documentation through to uh, the, commanding, the command group. Uh, so I went with about four or five guys, and we walked through. The moon was out, it was clear night, we walked in that direction, we knew it was easy to find. So within 10 or 15 minutes, we got to where we had to be. We handed over the documentation and there were some senior officers there. Um, General Maring was there, uh, Chris Schulenberg, um, who came from Sulu Scouts in Rhodesia. He was then acting as a consultant to uh, the SADF. Uh, you couldn't miss his figure. He was a, a big boy and he was there too. And uh, anyway, we handed over the documentation, the notes, and we asked some questions. I answered what we needed to do turn around to go back and then realized we guys, we lost because there was cloud cover. Now it's, you know, it's, a, it's a stupid thing. You know, here we are trained to work in the bush and none of us all out of compass to say what bearing we're walking on because we're walking in that direction. It's 10 minutes and you can see there's a, uh, you will find the fire and, and you will hear the people and so on. When you turn around and come back, it'd be just as simple. We turn around and we got lost. So it took us over an hour to get back, stumbling and bumbling around in the dark maybe realize that we're not infallible even as special forces soldiers we make mistakes so it's you know it's lessons learned from that thing and I, I i did feel a bit of an idiot i must tell you that carol you were not lost that night were you still struggling uh, with your lmg uh, which you haven't even fired i suppose uh, yeah. that's why you did <laughs> no i haven't um, um i'll i'll get to that but that that evening um we had a resupply with um with some food and stuff and uh, we got a, a leg of lamb, I think, Greg can't, can't remember, but I think so. And I was busy brying, so they got lost, but I was okay. <laughs> um, no, we, did, we, we did have our, our, our special resupply. And I also remember that the day, that afternoon too, um, there was a Germany or chaplain with us as well. Uh, we, after we'd finished the briefing and so on, he just said, like we always did for all operations. And, you know, um, I think, I thank God today that I'm still alive. Um, and this was one of the last operations I had participated in as, from a special forces perspective. But God kept his hand over us that day. Um, there were some guys who, yes, who did lose their lives. Uh, but I say a big thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't agree with you more. Um, j just to come back to, to the mag. So that, that next morning before we left um, Oshivalu, I ran to the stores and I said to the guy there, I need, I need a mag, give me a machine gun. So we fiddled around there and he said, come have a look which one you want. And I ran in there and I mean, they all look the same, they're all the same. So I just grabbed one and uh, I needed a mount for the buffer. And there was a mount flying there that nobody knows what it was for. So I just took the thing and, and mounted the gun on the buffer and I think I took uh, a box of ammo, 2,000 rounds or something, and I just got on the buffle and we left. So I went to, to, to Major Jan and I said, Major, I need to shoot this thing. I've, I don't know when last it's, it's shot. I don't know where it comes from. I, I need to just do something. I need to shoot this thing. And he said, yeah, oh, just wait. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to a spot somewhere along the line where you can see if it works. So um, at Aounde, eventually... Um, I went to him again and I said, I need to shoot this gun because now all the way up, I've never shot this gun. I don't know if it works. Um, so he said, yeah, find a spot somewhere, but don't make a lot of noise. So, <laughs> so don't shoot too much, but just see if the thing works. So off I went and 
I shot a few rounds and I adjusted the gas and the thing seemed to be working. Um, and then in the operation, obviously, um, like, like things will go, um, it, it stopped working. But um, we'll, get, we'll get to that story. I understand you were attacked on the way there as well. You did run into the enemy or not? Yeah, we we went past, I think there was a cooker shop for those who don't know. It's like a like a shop that's like a, a small general dealer, but it's really sort of down and out. Uh, they sell a few cans of Coke and maybe a bit of food and some of the basics. We, we passed by that on the road, if I remember correctly. Um, I do know that... Um, we before we turned off the main road that we were on to go into uh, the area where the base was, there was a vehicle that was coming from the front. Um, and I don't think they thought um, it was, was a, an enemy convoy coming in to attack a base nearby. Now, I don't remember what vehicle it was, but I do know that we picked up some shots just before that. We're driving in and you could hear the rounds peeing off the side of the uh, armored uh armored sides of the of the vehicle now that was just one sort of incident thereof there are a lot of things that were uh, speculated some people knew more um what was going on especially the guys in the front we were quite far back at the back of the column at that stage um and we had the guys of five ricky ahead of us and i as i co remember correctly daryl will uh, support me in this i think the guys from six one mech in their rattles were behind us am i correct um, Greg, I think they were in front of us. It was um, five Reiki with the Cuspers, then the two Rattles, and then us, and then and then the Parabats. If I if I remember correctly, I I, I could be mistaken. Okay. But um, but and because I remember after that incident, where there was a gas truck actually that came from the top that just joined the convoy, and the guy shot him out. Obviously, then the two Rattles split off. And they went into the into their position where we, they were going to shoot from, and we continued onto the onto the base. But I, I can be wrong. I'm, it's it's a long time. I can't remember. One of the things I do remember, and there's a lot of speculation about it, um, that once we turned off this road, now it was sort of a, a it was a bit of a tar road in patches, and other places was just a hardened road, which was really bad. And when we got to our point, there wasn't a signpost saying turn off here enemy base there we we just turned off and we went off down into uh, a bit of a flay or a um a bit of a dried up valley where there used to be water and so on over there um and we drove through that and then we ended up cutting through a whole lot of trees and this is where i remember the rattles were nearby us because there was a lot of dust um, and as we we're driving through these trees mostly the smaller type uh, of hardwood trees and far boss and so on we saw, uh, and other people can't substantiate it, but we saw uh, a white Toyota pickup truck. Um, and on the pickup truck were some guys that looked like uh, they had come from um, some Rastafarian party. And they were on the back of this thing, and they were dressed in sort of like, like you often would see some of the militants from North Africa with like headgear and they had ak 47s and they were driving through the dust like this nobody knew who they were and at that stage we were mostly below the the decks of the side of the vehicle because the branches hitting us and and there'd been shots coming at us so we were going forward like that so there were few of us who actually saw the vehicle and when we questioned this everybody said no there wasn't a vehicle like that so i'm just raising this as a question somewhere along the line that it that it was there didn't see it again uh, but in all likelihood, it, it is a possibility that it could have happened. Yeah, if anybody here listening here have seen the vehicle as well, please let us know. But the actual attack plan was for you to deboss, to get out of your armored vehicles and attack this infantry. But were you going to go in as mechanized infantry, you know, Kufut style, run over them, shooting all the time? No, I, well, let me say no. Uh, yes, that was the plan that we would debus and get in there. I remember men, uh, early on I mentioned that we had a buffle that only had forward gears. It's fine with you in open terrain, which is semi-desert semi scrub. And when we got there, we realized besides the Shana or the open area with that hollow depression where there's water, often there's water, but it was fairly dry at this stage. 
Um, there in Ashana, you, your visibility can be one to 200 to 300 meters uh, with a bit of bush and so on sparsely scattered in between. Um, and then you go up into this slightly harder area or the dune as I refer to it. Um, and this is where the base would be. And we were expecting it to be like what we were going to do uh, or what, what we had trained for. But the bush was really, really thick at that stage. And that, you know, they were a lot more north to where we were. The rainy season had started, so everything was green. Um, and all the shrubs had started sprouting. So the little fall boss that you are used to, these little shrubs like this, were not little fall bosses anymore. They had been growing and they were quite substantial. And if your vehicles only got forward again, you drive into one of these like we did, we couldn't go back in reverse. We were stuck on this thing. So our, our front wheels might have been in the air, but we were stuck on that on that fall boss and we had to debus quite a bit earlier um than what was initially planned and um, so we jumped out at that stage there was a lot of shooting going on and um we we could hear the rounds hitting the side of the vehicle uh but you know it's it's time on it's time to play now and we jumped off and uh we started moving forward in a line we had um the the five recce vehicles in in a line with us and on the further on the farthest side i could see uh the guys from the pressure battalion that were there as well so we we got off to move forward um and that's when um the surprise was no longer a surprise anymore so they were fire support i suppose the five recce caspers would have had the heavy machine guns now that the five brownings things like that 101 is especially so where's the Air Force now? No, uh, um, Greg jumped the gun a little bit. <laughs> I did, um, I did. Um, the Air Force actually came in with Mirages before the attack started. So so they and the, they they didn't make, miss the base completely, but they also didn't hit the base completely. So they they hit the, the one side of the base. Um, so as we as we went in, we we all got into an extended line. So you were basically um, firing towards the front and and that's where you were concentrating and the guys next to us, the Caspers and whatever, they were all, you know, fighting forward. Um, uh, so there wasn't really cover for us from, from other cars. It was just going forward. Um, so yes, the Air Force did, did drop a few bombs and, and then they skedaddled. Um, but before we debust, we actually drove into an arc of fire that that Swapper opened up big arcs of fire all around the base. And our driver, realizing that he went into this arc of fire, reversed out of it, but he got stuck. Um, and then you guys debust because you also got stuck. Your cusp, your um, buffle also got stuck and you debust. But before we debust, um, they actually threw us with 60 mil mortars. And one of the mortars had an airburst just above our, our buffle. Um, and uh, quite a few oaks were very badly wounded. Uh, Greg, one of them, Sean, the other Sean, um, Pete Bosch, Bosch, and um, what what was the machine gunner's name? Glenn, Glenn Williams. Glenn, Glenn Williams. He was very badly hurt. So so yeah, that's basically what happened. And then we then this whole thing came to a standstill because then nobody. So we all debussed um, eventually. And then what happened was, um, I think it was red smoke. If we had casualties. Somebody popped the red smoke and threw it in front of the buffalo. And then all hell broke loose because then we pulled fire like, like nothing. So now we had this red smoke going up and everybody knew exactly where we were. And everything was just going absolutely crazy. I mean, it was, you know, I just hit the deck and lay down. Um, and it was just a massive firefight. And not from our side, because we were all pinned down, basically. Um, but there was a lot of fire coming out of the base. Um, and eventually, the parabats came around and, and, and took these guys out. But then we, at that stage, we had, we had a lot of casualties. 
I, I want to say that I, I want to say that the Air Force, uh, the planned or scheduled attack by the Air Force, was supposed to be in like 10, 15 minutes before we arrived and, and lined up. It must have been at least an hour and a half before. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's like stirring up a hornet's nest. So these guys knew that there was something coming. The Air Force is not just going to go and drop a few bombs and off target as well. Um, so by the time we got there. Um, they were pretty well set up and they were pretty angry. Um, wow. In retrospect, uh, when the guys went in and then covered the trenches and, and attacked the, the trenches and went in, um, when they turned around, they could see the neatly uh, marked out ox of fire that had been given to the 14 Comba 5s, the B-10 anti, anti-tank or anti-vehicle um, um, recoilless cannons. Um, and even their mortars. So where we were lying, you couldn't see anything because we're facing the bush that way. But from that side, they could see us. And once we had lined up and gone forward, I mean, as Daryl said, you know, we, we had air bursts. We also had B-10 that uh, hit the tree close to where we were. And there was a lot of machine gun come, fire coming to us. You know, the, traditionally they say, okay, line up. We're all going to line up. We can say, you ready? Okay, now we're going to move forward. No, that, that, that didn't happen. You know, it's, it's like uh, changing a hubcap on a moving car. This is what happened, boy. When we, we hit that ground there and we were pinned down and the fire just kept on coming in on us. And it was really difficult. Daryl said we were pinned down. We were under a tree. The two Shawns and myself were under the one tree. And um, the fire just kept on coming in. And I remember the tree raining down on us, raining this fine stuff. But then there was a lot of... Uh, Lots of fine stuff. That shrapnel that came down there, it, 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 it made quite a few holes uh, in us and a few other people like that. It was a funny incident while I was pinned down. Now, I'm with the guys. I'm supposed to be sort of the lead of the guys on the ground to go forward. Um, and we'd been pinned down forward. And then when they shot at us and we had the air burst, we had to move backwards. Um, I lost my knife, which I had on my webbing overhead, fell out. And my um, 70 radio, 76 radio that I had, had come off my, pout, off my belt and was lying over there as well. And it's funny how stupid things go through your mind. So now they're shooting at us. Um, and I see my knife lying over there. So it's about 15 meters forward. Um, but I also see the radio lying there. But I remember, hey, the knife I've got to get because it's mine. Number one. Number two, the radio I'd signed for it, I ma- got to make sure that I've got to hand it back when I'm finished over here. So I crawled forward to go and do that. And there were massive explosions behind me where we had been. And I, Sean, uh, the two Sean's were quite badly hammered uh, when I say hammered in terms of injured. And I think I would have been injured worse had I not been there because I'd gone a lot closer to where it was and just behind some trees and some bushes. So I grabbed the stuff, my knife and the radio, and I went back to where we were. Um, and we really, we couldn't see where we were fighting against because the fire was just coming at us at that stage. And that's when the red smoke went out. And obviously um, it wasn't a, a very good state of affairs. I do remember it's like being kicked. Um, if anybody's ever been in a bar fight or something like it, and you're lying on the ground, um, or you played rugby or soccer, or somebody just really wants to stuff you up and beat you up. That's what it's like. It's like being kicked in the ribs, being kicked in the head, and being you bounce around the ground. The shock from those explosions just bounces you around, um, and and you don't hear anything. It's like silent, but there's these massive explosions going on, and things happen in slow motion. So now I'm going to retell a story over here because Daryl's not going to tell it, so I will tell it. So now they're starting to get people out and next thing i see out at my right hand side out i see daryl coming and grabbing uh i think you grabbed sean mcafee first if i'm correct sean fraud uh, i i grabbed um glenn first he was glenn sitting first. in the buffalo he couldn't get out so i had to get him off the buffalo okay but after that when you were on the ground on the ground okay so grabbed him sean fraud and took him because he was bleeding all over, took him and the ambulance must have been like 100, 150 meters further back to our right. Got him there and came back. Now we're trying to fire. And so you can't see very much uh, where you are, but we're trying to return fire and so on like it. So it's a bit like, you know, knocking against a tin in a big firefight like it. Meantime, the the Caspers uh, uh, around us and the uh, Rattles were giving their, maximum fire so there was fire going on but the fire coming from the base 
level at us where we were was far worse. Then you took uh, Sean McAfee and it took him. And then you wanted to come back and get me. And I, I didn't want to go. And you said, no, come, brother, come. So we hobbled back to the ambulance. And by the time we got there, I was, I was the last guy to get in at that stage. And I remember Pete Bosch was um, above. He'd been hit in the um, in the groin. He was bleeding very badly. He was pouring blood down on the, on the stretcher below. And Glenn Williams was underneath him as well. And Glenn had got a headshot like that. So he was a bit out of it, but he was bleeding quite profusely from that. And the rest of us were on the ground. Your vehicle that had reversed, had driven out to the driver there, the driver had driven over Gert Engelbrecht, which had been lying on the ground. So the Buffel went over Gert Engelbrecht, uh, who was lying, um, obviously either taking cover or firing, and drove over him and broke his pelvis. So Gert was in immense amount of pain, and he was we could hear him moaning uh, and crying in the, in the back of that vehicle as we left. Um, the strange thing that I do remember, we had a... We had a medic that was with us. Do you remember the medic, Russell Wheeler? Yeah. Yes, now, indeed. whilst we were whilst we were uh, at Oshivello training, um, he never did. Uh, Russell never did anything. If if all he did was put on suntan lotion, he had short pants and slip slops and sunglasses, and he was tanning because there was nothing really much for him to do. So of course we took a bit of a dislike to him, and we used to tease him and do whatever we wanted to. So. Here's the strange thing. Now you've got the guys all dressed in military fatigues and things like this. And out of the corner of my eye, when you were busy doing this, I see this guy come out there, but he's wearing sort of these uh, beach sunglasses. He had like a Magnum styled uh, short sleeve shirt on, like you would wear when you're going to the beach. I mean, you, you know, Magnum from the, from the 70s and 80s series, like it played by Tom Selleck. He comes running out to do, and he's grabbing guys and pulling them in. And so it's amazing. And he brought them into the ambulance. I don't know if there were one or two ambulances. I, I don't recall. There was, was only, only one. one. And it came okay. out of the fight. It was yeah. completely big shambles. Yeah. But, um, and I remember, I remember Russell doing this. And, you know, my perspective in an instant change. And here's a guy who's just busy doing his job and under, but it just sort of looked, totally um out of whack i mean this guy in his in his um magnum colored hawaiian shirt should not be there you know anyway so then we went to the ambulance and then there were a lot of pot shots being taken in the ambulance i remember the the uh the sounds ricocheting of the ricocheting bullets inside of that and dr stephen colain was then the doctor on board and he was trying to patch the guys up as best as possible um i mean i remember him there but he also then came to see me when we were in hospital uh, at one more later but you know when you're in battle situation like it's difficult and then the ambulance if i'm correct then moved directly to the rear um admin and, and control area where they took the people out and they were trying to administer um help as best as they can yeah um yeah during that thing when when i was carrying glenn over i actually asked um um what the medic to yes. give me cover fire down the arc of fire because the ambulance stopped on the other side of the arc of fire and i showed them they must come closer but they wouldn't come over the arc of fire so <laughs> i had to run over the arc of fire so when when i had glenn on my back he was just he's quite a big oak and he was he was heavy um so i i said to to russell just shoot down this arc of fire so that i can run over and he was on the ground there with his R4 shooting down and I ran across with, with him. Um, yeah, so, but the ambulance actually came out of the fight. I don't know how they did, but when, when we had that, um, that um, evening, that um, evening about um, firewood, um, Stefan explained that they got lost in the ambulance. So they drove into the base. <laughs> and then when they saw when they saw the red smoke, they knew there's trouble, and they just went for the smoke. But at that stage, they were right inside the base, so they came out of the base towards the red smoke. And luckily, that's that's where we were, so um, we could get everybody on. And then then there was an assembling assembling point where they took all the wounded and um, to the north of the base, just before the one of the shonas. Uh, actually, and they lay all the guys out there, um, and um, 
and then from there on they put you guys on queer fools or stuff and, and that's correct you, uh, down south yeah I, I did see in the in the course of the battle because we must remember at that stage that we were not the center of the battle there was a lot more going on that 101 guys uh, were really involved and so were the five ricky guys um, I know that even one of the five Ricky Caspers got lost for a day until they eventually caught up with the, with the rest of the group. But the paratroopers were to the right of us. And I remember in the battle when I was lying there, somewhere after I was wounded and before I was taken off, I could see one of the medics going in to pick up um, some of their guys had been shot. And, and he, he had the medic thing because he had the white cross on the patch on his, on his arm. And he picked up the guy and he turned around you know, no. Some people either don't know how to spell Geneva Convention, or they don't, they don't give one iota to it. And he was shot in the back as he was busy carrying the guy out like that. Um, I don't remember who it was. I, I, I sort of vaguely remember. I remember he had blonde hair, and I remember being in hospital uh, later on, and I was being questioned by uh, concerned parents who were walking around in the halls in the hospital because they knew their sons had either been killed or had been injured and the defense force was not giving them an answer that's that so no. it was very difficult um but i remember now going back to the assembly point where we were all of our kit was confiscated including our rifles that's a bit like uh, a cyclist going to ride the tour de france and you get to the starting point um and you ride and then somewhere along the line you have an accident you get off and so on you've been patched up now you want to continue but somebody takes your bicycle away so that's sort of what i'm thinking so now your rifle is taken away your kit is taken away um and you're feeling very sort of um vulnerable at that stage i had a camera on me i had a olympus trip camera and i was taking photographs at the rear assembly area and colonel james hills who was the operation commander saw me with a camera charged over to me and ripped it out of my hands now i I'd been issued with a camera, part of it was to take photographs and so on. So I had photographs of the whole trip from Oshivella training all the way through to where we were, and I'd taken photographs. Yeah, and some were fun and some were good things. It was good for the archives and so on. He snatched it out of my hand, opened the camera, and he just took the film out of it. And then he took the, the five spools or five or six spools that I had on me, and he took those as well, and he just took them and he walked off with it, which I'm very sorry about. It would have been worthwhile uh, to have kept to this day. The guys were being treated at the back there. Um, they were given morphine. They were bandaged and things like that. And we had to wait quite a while. And there were one or two other guys, like Rodney Mills, and he got a bit of shrapnel through the air. But this was the second phase when the guys were doing the follow-up. And they left us behind. And everybody was then continuing going through the base and doing the mop-up. Whilst I was at the back there, um, I could hear the radios. Now, Jamie Hills is busy coordinating because he, he's the operation commander. So he had the guys from Fire Ricky, from 101, from 61 Mech, everybody talking to him. And there was a young loot from 101 who was on the radio. And I could hear him. He was crying. And he was saying to the colonel, he said, in Afrikaans, saying, Colonel, my casper has been shot out. He said, all my guys are dead. I'm we on fire and I'm the only guy here. I need somebody to come and help me. And, the, and he said to him, he said, sorry, my boy. He says, you're on your own. There's nothing we can do. We can't help you. You have to fight your way out or you have to do it. And that's it. But you're on your own. God be with you. And that was it. And this is one of the Caspers that was shot out. And strange enough, the same way the Caspers were shot had happened the previous year in Operation Coliseum, where these guys had uh, strims, which they were using um, on the Caspers. They also used RPGs. And if you shoot the Casper from behind that flat door like a um, that's where a lot of the shots are coming in from the back door. And they were just, uh, you know, that incendiary round, which goes inside, it bounces around and it does an immense amount of damage. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just, just before all of this happened, I was, I was the gunner on, on this buffer. And obviously as, as we went in, we were still all moving in the buffers. I was shooting with this mag and this thing will jam every, 50 shots and then Glenn will stand up and he'll shoot over my head with the PKM and I'll go down and sort out the, the jam and then go up again and shoot and just as I, I was shooting again the thing jammed and as I went down behind the bulkhead we had the air burst so you know things just I don't know why things work out that way but I, I know I know why um, mm -hmm. But if if I didn't have if my gun didn't jam on that exact second, I probably wouldn't have been here because I, I was standing up, and uh, yeah. that's why Glenn got the big 
a lot of shrapnel in his head because he was standing up when mm -hmm. I was down. Um, so, yeah, so the gun did leave me in the lurch eventually, which <laughs> was it? Well, and I, I, just, I just want to take this opportunity just to say thank you for pulling me out of the crap because, um, you know, I'm a pretty, you know, disciplined soldier that I was and a bit of shell shocked at that stage. So, Daryl, thank you. You saved me that day. Uh, pleasure. Anytime. Anytime. I'll do it again. <laughs> so, yeah. Chris, w once we were in that, in that rear area, um, it was late because the attack must have happened around about 11 in the morning. Correct me if I'm wrong. About 11 in oh. the morning. Yes. And by late that afternoon, um, they decided it's time to withdraw, but they were worried about enemy troops around us because they didn't know what was happening. So um, they had loaded all of our equipment, uh, our kit that we were carrying and rifles and so on on the back of a Quefo, which is a 10 tuck armor plated vehicle with a flatbed. It had food and drinks and things like that on that. Um, there were too many people to go into the ambulance. I know the ambulance went, they took the guys who were uh, very badly wounded uh, in the ambulance. And then the rest of us, they put us onto the back of the square floor. And we then, um, as it was getting dusk, then uh, moved to uh, sort of a rear echelon area where we had to wait a while. Um, going past the area where we previously had, had pot shots taken at us on our entry coming in. So, of course, you're feeling quite vulnerable. You don't have anything with you and you bandaged and so on like that. Um, yeah, I, I had quite a few rounds. I didn't realize that one of my injuries was 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 fairly bad because I had um, shrapnel on my femoral artery, shot through the foot, and a few others, one through the arm and things like that. But you know, you're still feeling fine. I think the adrenaline um, counters that for you in many respects. But there were guys out there that were really really bad, and I I was I was shuddering to think that we might lose people like Pete Bush or even Glenn or some of the people like that, because when there's so much blood in the ambulance and so on, and, and the guy is in absolute pain and there's not much they can do, you know, you are concerned. Anyway, so they moved us to back uh, area. Then we had to drive quite a lot further back to a safe area, which they then made safe where the helicopters could come in and land and pick up the, the casualties for casualty evacuation we were the last guys to then be evacuated. And I think it was around about two or 3 AM in the morning. Uh, I was the last helicopter that went out that they flew us to uh, the makeshift um, hospital in Ondangwa. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. But um, be be before that, when, when you guys were in the ambulance and, and you moved off, um, that was half of Tureki gone, just yes. about. There was seven, seven guys. Um, wounded. Um, I know there was other superficial wounds. I had a little piece of scrap, shrapnel in my back and I, I know um, Major Jan also had some shrapnel but not, nothing serious. Um, so then we heard on the radio because I was the signaler also. <laughs> so on the radio they, they, there's, there's two parabats missing. They, they, they can't find them. They presumed that they were, that they were dead but they didn't know where they were. And we had a, a black driver from five that drove our buffalo all the way up. And I think you guys also. Mm -hmm. But then after this whole commotion where we had all these air bursts and all the fighting, um, when I eventually got my bearings about me, the front door was open, but the driver was, was gone. I don't know where. He, he obviously went back to, to get into a Casper. But there we sat with this buffalo and there was no driver. So then I became the driver of the buffalo as well. So we actually went into the base on, onto a side of the base and we were driving around me and Stian and, and Strace and I can't remember who else. And we're looking for, for this, for the parabat, um, which we obviously didn't find because they found them somewhere else. Um, and, and we then moved back to the assembly uh, uh, to reassemble because now they they said we're going to attack the base on foot because there was a part of the base that was not not cleared out so we all assembled again and then when we got got to the assembly point i think it was on their parade ground or you know the basis parade ground we were standing there and all the vehicles were standing there um and me and stian came 
I got out the biffle and we walked towards um, the command cusper. And uh, Jamie Hill said, there's a DSHK just at the back here. He wants two guys to, to just go and make sure that the thing can't, can't shoot. So me and Stian and two black operators from five, we ran and uh, we looked for the DSHK. So we found the thing. Um, but it was hit in the in the in the bombing with the mirages. But there was women soldiers there. I think there was two or three of them. They were already passed off, but they were there. So we tried just to take the the, the breach block out and just make it make it um, unusable. Anyway, um, we then on our way back. I just heard somebody screaming, Migs, 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 get down, get down. And I ran and I, I dived underneath the Casper. And then this aircraft came and he just shot right between us. I mean, it was, I, I, I can't remember the distance, but it was, it was close. And it was actually an Impala that the guys brought in, two Impalas, and they, they had to give us some cover fire or something, but they shot right between us, you know, they didn't hit anybody, but Jamie went totally crazy and he just swore at them and told them to go back home. And he had a total sense of humor failure. And then from there, obviously, um, we did this attack on, on, on foot into the base um, and we got to a certain point, but, you know, we, we did maximum fire and everybody just started shooting and we moved five yards or five meters forward. And then there was just massive fire back from them. And you could hear this, there was a guy with a PKM that was running in the trenches. Then you hear him from there and then you hear him from there. And he was, well, there might've been more, but you could, you know, he was really doing his thing in, in the trenches running up and down and, and really keeping us pinned down. So, um, um, I had, I, by that, that time, I took Glenn's PKM and I, I went in with, with his PKM. And at some stage, I, I just took, I didn't have pockets for, for, for the belts. I just put them around my neck. And some, at some stage, we went down and um, there was a big shooting going on and I rolled away and I lost one of the belts. So... Um, what was the, the captain's name that was with us? He was on my before, uh, Jojo Brains. He, um, he said, you better go and get that belt because we're going to need it. So I said, okay, give me cover fire here and I'll roll there. So I, I rolled back to the belt and retrieved it. But I'm telling you, there was dust all over me. So the guys uh, was really putting up a big, big, big fight. And eventually we, we decided to just pull out and then um, after that it was getting late as well we then um, just regrouped and got on the vehicles and we we started exfiltrating and then on that that exfil um, and there's a lot of things that 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 has been written about this is that two reiki lost a, a, a buffalo on the way out and i just want to put it on record it's it's not true two reiki never lost a buffalo the parabats um, that went out with us, they capsized in a buffalo. I think they drove into one of those tank traps or something and the thing fell over. I remember we stopped next to it and somebody from either my buffalo or the other buffalo, because then I was the driver, got out and put some PE4 in it. But it never detonated, obviously. Uh, and I don't know what happened there. Um, so the thing wasn't destroyed, but we on the radio they just said, leave, leave the thing there, let's let's get out of here. And um, so all the there was nobody injured, all the parabats fell out. They picked up all their kit and jumped onto other buffles and, and off we went. So we there was a buffle that stayed behind. What it, it was definitely not two reggae's buffle. Um, yeah, the one that we had, the one that had been stuck in that fire boss was towed away by the recovery group. So I know that one also went back. Yeah, no, it definitely went back. It didn't, it didn't stay behind. But um, yeah, we, we didn't lose a, a buffalo. Might have been the, um, not active, but it didn't stay behind. Mm. Um, 
but there's there's quite a few things on the internet where they show this buffle and they say it's Turek is buffle that stayed behind. It's not not the truth. Anyway, um, just something funny. What happened on the way back? It was late now. It was it was dark, and we were driving. And I don't know if you remember, Five Reki had a Casper with uh, this new GPS system, but it was as big as a computer. It was this big thing that they had in there, and they were navigating with this new GPS thing. Um, so at some stage, we we were obviously in a in an extended in a in a extended line. A no, single no, file. No. Single file. We were driving behind all the dust and stuff. And I was the driver and it was now pitch dark, no lights. And um, I heard on the radio, they said they're going to hang a loomy stick in a tree so that the guys can can find the way that we've, we, we're going. And so off we went and I found the loomy stick and I went past it and I just kept on going. And about an hour and a half, two hours later, on the radio, come, come into a firing line. There's line abreast and whatever. There's there's something here. We must we must sort this thing out. Come guys, there's trouble here. And we all went um, extended line off, going forward again. And there we hit this loomy stick that the guys. So we went in a complete 360 with this new GPS system that they had. I, I don't know what happened. Um, but yeah, and then obviously we went off um, to the base, to the TV that you guys were in and were mm -hmm. lifted out of. We slept there that night. And then for the next two days, they, um, they threw us with DM-21s and multiple rocket launches and stuff. But it was speculative fire. They didn't really know where we were. But for the next two days, they were just shooting at us. Um, correct me correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember also from reading thereafter that there was a, another base slightly to the north of the one that we had attacked, um, which had been able to supply firepower. Um, and I think that's where the B-21s were coming from, yeah. uh, if I'm correct, yes. Yeah, apparently, uh, obviously, but they, that's the, the base, apparently, and the 101 guys will, will know more about that where the guys came from that attacked 101 because 101 wasn't really part of the fight. They were supposed to be stopper groups to the north and to the south and onto the Shaunas. So the guys that were squirt out of the base, they would have taken out. But then the Oaks came from the north, um, from, from that base apparently. And I am not 100% tuned up on that. And then they started attacking 101. And that's where 101's fight uh, really. They, 101's fight didn't come from our base. It came from the from the base up north. Mm. And apparently, um, we underestimated. I know somebody along the line said the reaction time is going to be six hours or something, but the reaction time was less than two hours. And that's when they hit 101. So anyway, that's, um, that's basically our story. I, I think, Greg, uh, I don't know if you've got anything else to say. No, I don't. I just, you know, the guys, the, the guys that stayed behind, obviously exfiltrated uh, late on. It took you another three or four days to come out, if I'm correct, to get back to, to Namibia. No, we, okay. no, we actually um, pulled back probably about 100 guys or so. And then we made a big TV. Um, uh, the parabats weren't there. It was only five recce and two recce. And we, um, we walked patrols and laid some ambushes for the next week or so. We stayed in country, um, stayed around there. Um, I remember just um, walking around and, and doing ambushes, but there was nothing, nothing happened. Strays one night, we were setting up a TV and I was on, on, on guard with the, the night vision and he put out a claymore with a, with a sh um, strike. What do you call that thing? Mm, striker. Striker, yeah. And he was in his in his bivy, busy moving his his kit around, and he pushed the striker, and the and the claymore went off. So I went blind, obviously, and I couldn't see or hear or anything. Um, and we all thought, well, they pinpointed us and they're throwing us with mortars or something. And Strace didn't know he pushed the the striker, but eventually we realized that he. 
it's actually the claymore that went off and nobody throwing us with mortars or anything. So obviously we packed up and ran off another 10 kilometers or something and made another base. So yeah, basically. Hey guys, your Kazovac, I think the last um, aircraft um, that we were loaded onto to go back to Pretoria because we were being shipped to one military hospital in Pretoria at Fortracker Wuchter, which is now Tabu Chwane. Um, we must have left at about four in the morning because I remember we arrived at about half past eight, nine o'clock um, at, uh, for, at the, uh, Sw not SWAT Corps, at the other Air Force Base, um, Waterkloof. Waterkloof Air Force Base. Um, and I remember writing about that the medic who came to pick up, pick us up as most re I still remember him talking about it. He was so grumpy about having to pick up some sick guys um, and take them to the hospital. Little did he know that these guys were injured and he had a fight with his girlfriend that morning because he couldn't stay, uh, stay with her and had to go and drive guys. And he gave us a really bad ride. And I remember Ochad Engelbrecht with his broken hip was in the vehicle and he was screaming at this guy. He said, if I can get out there, I'm going to come and blick some you. He said, because he was in so much pain. And this, this medic didn't give iota he wasn't interested he just dropped us at the hospital and then i think he packed his stuff and went off to see his girlfriend but you know then the reality hits you you get back to south africa and nobody even knows what's going on here and i remember that in the articles that appeared in the newspaper obviously the defense force was and their spin doctors were trying to make it look better than it was um and they said oh you know only a few people killed and then so a lot of uh swat territory forces uh, southwest african Ter territorial force guys were injured and so on they tried to play it down big time because obviously you want to boost the morale of the country the people and everybody else and so on i just remembered mm, it's not exactly the truth is it yeah yeah and i think at this point i i think we have to give credit to to the parabats if they went with us that day and they took out I think there was a, a, a B10 and a DSHK and, 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 and the mortar right. pit. If they didn't take them out, then we would have been um, in big trouble. Um, not that we weren't. But also, I think this is the right time to just remember that 15 guys died in this operation. Mm -hmm. And I think seven of them were, were parabats or six. That's I'm not 100% right. of sure of the, of the figures. And then obviously a lot of 101 guys and so it was a big sacrifice that that was that was made that day and a lot of people lost their lives a lot of people was wounded if you think about Tureki, we were 19 including our leader group okay so that takes four oaks out of the people that were in the buffels and of those seven were casaway so half yeah, half of the team stayed behind that weren't Kazavak, that weren't injured. So it, it was a big knock if you look at it like that. I know other people lost their lives, which were much, much worse, obviously. But um, yeah, I think it, it's, um, it was time that, that um, we spoke about it. And hopefully other guys that were there will also speak about this operation in future. Thank you for the opportunity, Chris, and to everybody out there just to listen to our side of the story. Um, you know, it's not nice talking about when you get a bloody nose. Uh, but hey, these things happen. Um, and we are here to also remember those guys and to acknowledge them and just to say thanks to everybody who pulled their weight and did their things. And uh, thank you for allowing us to talk. Thank you, Chris. We really appreciate it. Greg, thank you very much. I'm sorry Sean didn't make it, but um, hopefully he'll have something to say about it as well. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Bye, Donkey. I must tell you guys, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking this is one of the best episodes we've ever recorded. And I don't say that lightly. There's obviously a deep friendship between the two of you. So perhaps I should ask you what happened after the war then, because this is, what, four decades ago? And here you're sitting, cry it. Well, Greg, you don't have gray hair, you're blonde, man. So you just stick to each other. You, you just cool to this very, very day. Yes, we are still good friends. Uh, Daryl is one of my best friends that I've got. And not because of that. We, we, we share our same values in terms of being Christian men um, and our faith. 
but you know he's one of the guys i know who who has the most tabasco on any steak anytime anywhere um he loves his coffee and when we spend time together it's just one of those things that brotherhood of this type you cannot measure up to so yeah he's my brother in more ways than one yes uh, i can say the same greg um i i don't have a lot of friends if i count it on my one hand there's three fingers left over so and you definitely one of them or oh, that's not left over um so yeah we we um we lost contact of uh, for a while it was not not long but we met up again eventually and um we've been very um close you stayed with us for a while and uh we don't see each other as, as much as we would like, but we do see each other now and then. Um, but it's nice uh, to still have you here with us. And it's a, it was a pleasure. Uh, thanks for your friendship. I appreciate it. I know that uh, some people are going to ask us here. So I have to finish with by asking you to, uh, those who were evacuated to uh, Yenmo. Did they survive? Did it go well with them? All of our guys did survive. Um, subsequently, with time, there are guys who obviously have passed on through uh, as a result of old age, health, and so on like that. There were some guys who took um, a severe beating uh, emotionally and psychologically. Um, look, we were debriefed. Um, we were always debriefed after an operation like this. The, the psychologists came in and they helped us through things like this. But there are some people who did um, find it difficult and there were one or two who never really recovered from that. And they sort of withdrawn from, I wouldn't say the public eye, but also from um, association with us or friendship with us. But that's, that's what happens in life. You know, you, you have something bad which befalls you or that you experience uh, and sometimes you're not able to recover or you find it very hard just to deal with and sometimes avoidance is the easiest way to do that so no, we didn't lose anybody um in hospital we saw a lot of the casualties that were there there was one trooper that was in the back of one of the uh rattles, uh, where they used to fire the mortar from and the extra charges that you take off the mortar or you put onto the mortar to give it more or less distance um they'd been throwing down at their feet and the standard operation procedures has got to go into a bin. And as they were firing and firing this mortar, um, it was getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And what was happening that some of the charge that, that you put onto it doesn't um, fire uh, and just, and go off with the round that was being fired. And sometimes it just comes out of the barrel and lies down on the ground. And what happened that it ignited that uh, propellant around them. And this guy sustained uh, third degree burns of about 80% of his body. He, he's still alive today, but he was in suspended, I wouldn't say animation, but he, we used to see him in hospital and he was in a suspended um, harness to, so that he could be treated with his burns and so on. Um, you know, so we didn't see any of the guys who died. I mean, 101 and the 101 and the parachute battalion lost uh, most of the guys. Uh, but no, we didn't see any of our guys uh, that had passed on at all. And it, it only happened much later, as I said, of natural causes. Do you two have any advice for a youngster looking at who says, well, wants perhaps to join the army or perhaps any advice? Daryl, I'm going to ask you first. Yeah, I, I um, um, it's a difficult question for me. I, my, my son is 15 years old and all he wants to do is be in the army. Um, but um, with the, the situation that we're in at the moment, I don't know if, if that's the, the, the best thing to do. Um, maybe in a different country, it, it, it might work. But um, I, I will not um, discourage it at all. I think it's, uh, it was the best years of my life and I'll do it anytime over and over again. Um, I always say before I go back to school for half a day, I'll go back to the army for two years, no problem. So um, that's how I feel about it. And I've only got fond memories. And although it, it didn't always go the way you, you, you thought or would have been or 
you would like it to be. And uh, a lot of people got hurt and wounded and whatever that everything that went with it over the years that I that I was part of it. Um, but yes, it was the best years of my life. I will not change it for anything. Of course, um, Daryl's psychologist and I were having long conversations about him wanting to go back for, for three years. Okay, I'm just I'm saying it in jest. Uh, if people ask me that, I think it's very much up to the individual and the individual's parents because uh, at the stage, whether you are a young boy or a young girl, the opportunities do present itself. Um, I, I, I love my country, but I don't love our government and I don't love what is happening here at the moment. Um, and I have had a few people which have asked me, um, what should they, what would I advise for their sons? Um, should they join special forces here? Yes, you can, but I think you're very limited. Unfortunately, the, ra the racial bias in the country still makes it extremely difficult. And I've seen guys who've been career soldiers having a difficult time. Um, as I have seen other people whose sons have left and gone to join um, the military forces, either in the United Kingdom, um, Australia, um, and the States, and, and, and France as well. Um, and they've done exceptionally well for themselves. Um, but it does mean that you obviously got to have um, your matric or your high school certification. Um, and you've got to have a will to be able to get there. And you're also going to have the means to get there because to get to some of the countries is a bit more difficult. I think France is easier. If they drop you off at the French Foreign Legion, but you've got to be fairly good at speaking some French. It would, it would help you. So if it would my, be my advice, yes, if you really want to go, if you want to make a career soldier out of yourself, look at one of the other countries around the world because I think there you can still make a proper career out of yourself. Yes, what I felt is when I was speaking to General Bowman, the former officer commanding Special Forces, is that the problem is once something happens to you in Special Forces, you might not get the treatment which you guys got because one mole sadly is, is not there anymore. But the good news is if you want to learn French well, my wife got French schools teaching people how to speak French, je parle français. It's actually not that hard, to be honest. It, it's quite close to English. But you know, at a certain age, you don't want to learn such things anymore. And I am at that age. Gentlemen, I have to thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your telling your story to us. I know we're going to have fantastic interviews with you individually as well. I say again for the paratroopers, 101 Battalion, 5 Reiki, 6 1 Mick, the other guys who are there, come and tell your stories to us. Let us speak about this Operation Firewood. It's important. It was one of the days, I believe, where the SADF took the most casualties or equal to what happened with Riku Battalion at Savati. And therefore, it's important. And if there's lessons for us to learn from this, let us learn it. Otherwise, it was in vain, in my opinion. And this story was from the viewpoint of two Reiki. I'm saying it again. So it is limited. But I must say, it was fantastic listening to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Until we meet again, God bless.